There are a variety of techniques for the risk analysis process. There are four that we'll mention here and explore in more detail in the techniques section of this training. The bow tie method is particularly interesting and useful in the risk analysis process. It's a simple diagram of causes, consequences, and controls, but you can visualize them on a single sheet of paper. It has the benefit of being able to be hand-drawn and illuminating. The SWIFT technique that we mentioned earlier, which is a structured team-based set of prompts to identify and analyze risks in more detail. The likelihood and consequence matrix we've been using, and I'll illustrate again here in just a moment. And scenario analysis, where we can imagine um, elaborate and competing outcomes. So instead of just using it to identify risks, we can actually use scenario analysis to explore a variety of consequences from a single risk event, as well as a number of factors that might contribute uh, to the likelihood rating. When we are analyzing a risk to determine the likelihood rating, there really are three things that we should be looking at. The first is expert opinion. And by expert opinion, again, we don't mean expert opinion in the sense of an expert at trial. We mean an informed domain expert who provides a consistent assessment of that likelihood relative to their domain expertise. So for example, if you are interested in sales data because the number and types of transactions matters in your likelihood assessment, then speaking to someone in sales or accounting that has actual access to data about the sales transactions is your best source. Lawyers can certainly be experts in the likelihood of a lawsuit being filed, but probably not an expert in the likelihood of a particular transaction being closed uh, out in the field. Business managers might be experts in the likelihood of a process failure as well. So lawyers might worry generally about cybersecurity risk, but people in the IT department will know far better about what they're actually doing and the likelihood that those practices or technologies will lead to a data breach. Historical data is also important because it can inform our judgment about the likelihood. So if our historical data says that these types of transactions are rare, but we also know that we have a new product or service we're rolling out and that the nature of those transactions or the number of a particular type might change because of that, then we're blending that historical data and that expert judgment uh, to come up with a better likelihood rating. The data must be relevant uh, and sufficient. Thirdly, we can look at probability forecasts. Now, this is a mathematical estimation of probability, and it requires statistically valid models and historical data. But it's generally not available to us in legal risk assessments, as we've talked about before. But there may be particular areas where it is useful in a very limited and controlled way, as long as those are statistically valid. But generally, it's unrealistic for estimating the likelihood of most legal risks for most organizations. As we look at risk analysis in terms of likelihood for legal risk, we want to think about the likelihood of contract risk, litigation risk, regulatory risk, and structural changes. What that means for contracts is that we're looking for the chances that there will be a breach of contract or a breach of contract claim. That can be on a per contract basis or in the entire portfolio of our contracts. The contract risk, for example, is often a case of high frequency, low consequence uh, issues arising in the case of sales contracts, uh, or low likelihood, high consequences in the case of things like mergers and acquisitions agreements. Litigation risk, when we look at likelihood of litigation, we're looking at the likelihood of an actual claim being filed or a potential litigation outcome and thinking about the factors that might contribute to a litigation outcome that might involve an analysis of the merits of the claim, uh, as well as the posture or likely uh, plaintiffs and what motivations they would have. That's why when we said earlier that uh, lawyers' fees availability under a statute might affect likelihood, if lawyers' fees are uh, available under a statute, then the plaintiff's bar might have more incentive to uh, litigate a particular issue because it uh, they have a chance of defraying some of the uh, upfront costs associated with the litigation.
In the case of regulatory risk, we're looking at the merits of a regulatory violation um, and the nature of the penalty, also the likelihood that the regulatory enforcement action will be brought. If there is a technical violation of a regulation, but very little mechanism or uh, attention to that particular regulatory issue, that the violation might be clear, but the risk or the likelihood of a regulatory uh, risk materializing would be low because no one is actively pursuing enforcement. And finally, with structural changes, we're looking at the likelihood of a major change in the legal foundation of the business or an alteration of the business practices. What is the likelihood that an antitrust litigation will reshape the competitive landscape? What is the likelihood that deregulation will affect the pricing of our products or services? Those sorts of things will determine the likelihood of structural changes. So for example, if we use the likelihood and consequences uh, matrix and we gather input from our experts, so we're using that expert domain judgment approach with the likelihood and consequences matrix, we might get an analysis that looks like this. We have uh, a few that rate the likelihood of a particular issue of five, some as a four, and a few as a two, and the preponderance of the expert judgment is that the likelihood is rated as a three. Now, we will need to resolve these expert opinions. Um, And there are a variety of ways to do it, depending on your assessment of those experts, the quality of their judgment, um, and the factors that they considered, all of which might lead you to adopt one of the other techniques, uh, such as a structured interview, to inquire about the caliber of the analysis uh, and to drive for consensus around uh, a likelihood rating among those experts in the organization about whether a particular risk event is likely or not. When it comes to analyzing consequences, the factors we're looking at are those factors that would increase or decrease the consequences of the risk. So these are magnifiers or multipliers. Uh, One of the examples we gave earlier was the availability of punitive damages providing a multiplier effect uh, to the consequences we might suffer. And then we need to connect those consequences to our objectives. We need to identify, as we're analyzing uh, legal risk consequences, what objectives are actually affected. So those objectives might be financial in terms of profitability or revenue, but they also might be operational or strategic in terms of the consequences of not achieving uh, our ability to enter a brand new market. Maybe we're expanding into a new territory or a new jurisdiction, and this legal risk would undermine our ability to do that. That's a consequence that may not directly translate into a financial number, but would certainly have an effect on our objectives. Next, we want to look at the time frame for those consequences. So we talked earlier also about uh, the time frame of the risk event occurring, but there also is a time frame for the consequences. So consequences that are near in time, particularly with their financial, uh, might be weighted higher if for no other reason than the uh, discounted value of um, cash over time. But there might be other reasons why longer term consequences may or may not be as significant as near term. Uh, but near term consequences that are large might still be relevant or even even more relevant than near-term uh, lower consequence uh, events. So considering the time frame and capturing that in our risk analysis is important. Next, we want to consider the proximity. One of the things that happens in scenario planning or cause and effect analysis of the consequences is that we can easily spin out many uh, paths that a risk event can take, and we can identify derivative or knock-on or tertiary effects that would be negative uh, as it relates to our objectives. And the as the farther we get away from the risk event and the more steps in the chain of logic in that causation chain we get, the consequences become less proximate and they should be valued or rated as such. So that our overall rating, while we might identify some uh, you know third and fourth order consequences, they might not influence our consequences rating quite as much as something that is a first or second order uh, potential consequence. When we're analyzing consequences as it relates to particular types of legal risk, in the case of contracts, we're looking at the significance of the contract risk related to our organizational objectives. So if you're looking at the consequences of the enforceability of a sales contract, for example, um, the scope of those consequences for that contract risk can be really different. If it's a single Uh, sales contract and the enforceability of that contract, the consequences might be quite low because it is one among many sales contracts. 
If, however, the defect in the sales contract affects a large share or the majority or even all of the sales contracts, then that contract consequence uh, is very high because you're talking about jeopardizing the revenue for the entire organization for all or many of the sales contracts. So understanding the scope of those consequences as it relates to contract risk is really important. In the case of litigation, we're most often talking about the damages from that litigation that might ensue. Now, sometimes that is directly financial in the terms of a dollar amount, but in the case of an injunctive or equitable relief where we are prevented from pursuing an objective for some reason, or in the case of a positive risk, maybe we are allowed to pursue uh, an activity because we got an injunction in our favor and not against us, that's also a possibility. But we're looking at the consequences of litigation risk. Um, as they relate to our objectives. In the case of regulation, we're looking at the compliance implications of regulatory citations or remedies as they relate to our organizational objectives. So this most often means regulatory fines and penalties. It can also include non-financial consequences, such as the lack of availability of a permit or the denial of a license or uh, the request of an approval of a clinical trial in the case of pharmaceuticals, any regulatory action, whether financial or not, that might prevent us or hinder our objectives would be the kind of consequence we would want to identify when it comes to regulatory risk. And finally, with structural changes, we're looking at things like statutory changes, so laws that get passed by whatever national or subnational organiza- uh, authority uh, we're dealing with, uh, any antitrust rulings, or business practice changes. So a major competitor that changes pricing, um, that moves to a freemium business model, for example, from a paid model, can transform the structure of our industry and really change the way uh, we interact with clients and affect our business and how we restructure our sales contracts in that case, um, for example would really determine our ability to deal with these structural changes. But looking at those consequences of not only government action, but also broad business and industry practices that can change sometimes quite suddenly is uh, what we're after when it comes to structural change analysis. And if we go back to the likelihood and consequences matrix and looking at those consequences, here again, we have our ratings among experts. So we have surveyed in a formal way our internal experts to look at the consequences of some of these legal risks. And when we're looking at one in particular, you'll see that most of them rated this as a two, a few as a three, and maybe one or two as a four. So again, we can come to a conclusion about how to rate this finally by um, structuring uh, a follow-up interviews or questions or a making available, in the case of Delphi, the available opinions of others um, to come to some sort of consensus around the consequences rating. Ultimately, we're after a single value of the consequences rating of a particular risk because we're going to take that single risk, uh, that single likelihood rating, and that single consequences rating to determine an overall risk rating.